Hi, I'm Katie Mihalik, and today we're talking with Melvin Morrows about his book, I Confess, Diary of an Australian Pope. Hi, Melvin. Hi, Katie. Great to be talking to you. So tell me how you became a writer. Well, um, a million years ago, when I was 20, I started writing scripts for a very popular Australian TV satiric program, and they were accepted, and I found that I was earning... Uh, three times as much money from television than I was from teaching English. Uh, <laughs> so I kept writing and uh, here we are today. Have you always wanted to be a writer? I can't not be a writer. Yeah. It's not a matter of wanting, it's a matter of being. That's amazing. Okay, so you were writing for television. Did you say you were an English teacher also? The background to I Confess is I spent 47 years teaching <clears throat> with Jesuits. Then I had the good fortune to teach in France and in England for 14 years and then in Australia. So I've, I've looked at three different kinds of Catholic Jesuit culture and I've met uh, quite a lot of priests, including one very important one who eventually became the Vatican correspondent for the tablet. So uh, we had a lot of dinners and a lot of conversations. Man, can I, I wish I could have been just a, you know, a voyeuristic viewer during those conversations. You, you, you can be by reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, right? There you go. So very good point. So how did you come to write the novel? One of the things about growing old in Australia, and growing old means being over about 30, that you become invisible in theatre. And I've had a wonderful theatre career here and I can't whinge. But now at, uh, at 81, uh, I'm fairly um, invisible. And I was thinking, well, I have to write because I can't not write. And it was a matter of finding the right hook. And when I came up with the idea about a year ago of writing a diary, I thought, this, this is the answer because a diary is what you put in each day. And I can write that day's entry and it can be as mad or as interesting or as whatever because um every day is is different and once i had that i had the confidence to write my first novel okay that's amazing um and what an interesting concept and and what a way to discipline yourself did you really just write a little every day yes and uh, and so it really in a funny way yes it is a real diary of a of a real character who is unreal but uh certainly uh knows how to talk on a computer <laughs> tell me specifically what the inspiration for the book was finding the character and knowing his voice because it was a blend of quite a lot of priests i've met okay. but once I'd found the voice, then the character could speak. If that sounds crazy, then it's absolutely true. Crazy enough where it doesn't sound crazy crazy at all, right? So yeah. all of the priests that you were speaking with, do you think they'd recognize their voice in the book? They'd recognize their voice in certain of the things that my Pope says, and they'd probably get quite angry at some of the other things because it's not based on one person uh, once i found that character of the australian pope the square peg in the round hole uh, then then i had conflict and conflict means you've got a story do you think any of them have come across the book uh, one or two of my colleagues have and i thought i'd shock them and to my surprise and joy they've said this is terrific because you're saying things that should not be said by a Pope. Okay, wonderful. I love it. I love it. So what are some of the themes that you were looking to express in this book specifically? Well, you're giving me credit for having better organization than I did. <laughs> uh, the, the theme is square peg in round hole. What happens when a person who was elected to the papacy and meant to just be filling in before the next real pope comes what happens when that guy starts to have doubts and questions which of course you assume popes don't have 
So it was always the character. And I suppose it'd be quite, I'm, I'm sure there are quite a few of the um, subjects that interest me. But because I, I had this guy uh, having a little bit too much alcohol of a night before and when he was uh, writing his diary, I could allow myself craziness. So uh, it, it allowed me to make him go completely off key and crazy. Do you feel that some of the doubts he has were doubts that you were exploring or having? I'd say obviously, but it, I, I'm not that Pope, but there are certainly a, a number of questions which readers will say, wow, this guy sounds, um, uh, well, this, this Pope sounds like he's uh, off piste. Um, and I like that. In particular, how would you say this story is personal to you? Uh, because on some very controversial issues, I let my imagination run riot. Okay. And uh, that, that was perhaps liberating. And the reader will have to work out which bits I let them run riot on and which bits I was disciplined <laughs> on. <laughs> I love it. So beyond your personal experiences, did you do special, specific special research for this book? Uh, I had worked uh, when I was young. I'd worked for five months in Rome, and uh, that was interesting because I was keen, to, obviously, to see the Vatican. And I walked inside, and I thought, this is completely wrong. Uh, and I thought, if Jesus came back today, I, th I think he'd walk in here and go, sorry, you got it a hundred percent wrong, and that that surprised me. I thought, "What am I saying? What am I thinking?" And the answer was that. Wow. Uh, well, actually, what I was thinking is this is about monarchy. So, as we know, the story takes place in the Vatican with flashbacks to Australia, and it yes. has a great sense of both locations. The places are so visual and so beautiful and so deep, um, and so different. And so different. So because, it's a, uh, well, my Pope comes from Wollongong, which is sort of, well, it's south of Sydney, and I love it as a city, but it's a bit of a joke to some people because it's, uh, it, it's not a huge metropolis. And I love the idea of an accidental Pope coming from the wrong side of the tracks. Ah. Uh, it, it, it gives him a certain edge of personality. So it's it's safe to say that you're drawing from some of your own past experiences in regards to the Australian portion. You've hit the nail on the head. <laughs> okay. So each chapter starts with Pope John the 24th uh, stating which Saints Feast Day it is and then commenting on it. Are the opinions he voices here and throughout the book your opinions? In other words, where does Melvin end and Pope John begin? Uh, you you ask very clever, pointed questions, and I think <laughs> you've nailed it there. Because when I read these, when I read these stories, I thought this is very moving, or this is crackers, this is nuts. And any anyone who would believe this would believe anything. And I loved the idea of. Well, I mean, I can say that because who am I? I'm just some guy from down under who's writing a book. But when the Pope says, "This is crazy," I I had great release and and I guess I've written a lot of comedy and it did allow me to say things which I think and which when a Pope says them, I hope will entertain our readers. So when we talk about the antagonist, Cardinal Olivier Gabriel Fancha, in a different era, he might have been the protagonist, the hero who's trying to desperately maintain the status quo. Well, Pope John is rocking the boat and advocating for reform. So what does Olivier represent in the novel to you? The African Pope is an example of where the church, the Catholic Church, is divided today. There is a liberal view like um, Pope Francis. And then there's another view which sees, well, as if the, the church is some kind of police force, the parking police or tax department. Um, and they're wandering around everywhere telling you, you've got this wrong, you've got that wrong. Uh, this is the penalty for that. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, 
if that's the way to what heaven is, if heaven exists, uh, sorry, I'm not buying a ticket. Okay, fair enough. In, in your dealings with Catholic clergy over the years, has this resistance to change been your experience? The answer is yes. I, I, I think be, because they're off, because the clergy are often caught in this militaristic uh, clericalism, uh, of you know, bishops say yes or no. And I am sure that the big questions that we ask, I don't think yes or no, correct or incorrect. Uh, that's not the way I've lived, thought or believed. In this novel, you write about meals prepared by Sister Angelica in great detail, often making me really hungry while I'm reading. So my question is, why such a focus on food? Can I give you a one word answer? Sure. Appetite. Appetites, an appetite for theology, an appetite for religion, an appetite it, for sin. It's the key to the book, an appetite for all sorts of things, but let's not give too much away. <laughs> How concerned were you or are you that some readers might take a, offense to what you've written or was that the point? Completely unconcerned. If they, if they take offense, well, um, that seems to me to be their problem, not mine, because my character is alive. And if they don't like my character, well, don't have a conversation with him. With all of Pope John's questioning and doubt, it made me wonder, do you believe in God? I want to believe in God. I've spent my life trying to. And every day I pray and I hope well, I'll tell you who I pray for. I pray for Alexei Navalny in a Russian jail that that animal Putin put in. And he's now um, locked in solitary confinement, can't speak to his wife, can't see his children, can't have any mail. And uh, you've asked me about my belief. I'd love my prayer for his survival for that day. I'd love that to have some effect. I just don't know. I'm, I'm lost in that. But that's the truth of where I'm at at the moment. The soul has its seasons. I think my season now is winter, but I've lived long enough to know that seasons change. One can be lost and still keep walking on the path. Do you really pray for Alexi every day? Every day when I wake up, first thing. I think that's a lovely prayer. That's really nice. Did you grow up Catholic? Uh, yes. Okay. And are you, are you still practicing Catholic? I don't think Catholicism is like, if you're a member of a club, you should go there. If you're a member of a sporting team, you should rock up on a Saturday. I, I don't see it that way. I, uh, when I finished teaching, which was um, ooh, 16 years ago, I had a sense of exhaustion, of spiritual exhaustion, but also of release. And I'm enjoying that liberty now, which is why we're talking about I Confess. That's a great ending note. So, Melvin, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's been a delight. Thank you. Thank you. Look for Melvin Morrow's new book, I Confess, Diary of an Australian Pope at henrygraypublishing.com or ask for it at your favorite neighborhood bookstore. Until next time, happy reading, everyone.